there's a chant called an auspicious night and this this chant here uh, is what I'm going to talk about in this discussion particularly about uh, steadiness about mental steadiness why mental steadiness is crucial uh, in not only in practice but in life you know, steadiness is a uh, is a thing that uh, is not talked about much we talk a lot about focus right out there in in the world but we don't talk about mental steadiness now mental steadiness obviously is a product of uh, a lot of things right it's a it's a it's a culmination of things coming together it's your focus it's your concentration uh, uh, practice or capability it's also how you see life your views it's also really important um, your your resolve that's really important how what how you resolve to live your life now of course in a Buddhist context that we we the the resolve is all around uh, sticking to morals doing no harm right and living uh, a mentally secluded life right and I've explained what a mentally secluded life is um, in previous videos but uh, I, I may touch on it later on in this video, but sec mental seclusion does not mean, seclusion does not necessarily mean that you just live in a cave and don't talk to anybody, right? Although that could, that is definitely part of it, but you can be mentally secluded even in a, in a busy place, like even in a busy monastery where you can mind your own business and just go about your daily activities. But the, the thing about mental seclusion is that there is a focus. Now, usually, uh, the word for sati, uh, the 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 translation for sati is uh, awareness, but I tend to think that it's also about focus. It's what you're focusing on. It's what you're putting your attention to, giving your attention to, and that's part of concentration practice as well. But focus in the sense that you're always aware of your parameters. Now, I spoke about this at length in in my previous video so if you want to get a, a whole deep dive on go for a deep dive in sati <clears throat> i did that in the previous video so i'm not going to do that here but focus right and resolve as i was saying before now steadiness is a byproduct of all these things and morality gives you a sense of steadiness as well because when your morals are in line when your morals uh, are in check, the mind is actually quite relaxed because you're not sitting there uh, like a thief or or like a, a, a violent person or someone who's done a lot of bad or is looking over your shoulder, wondering what's going to happen, you know, when are they going to come knocking on the door. When one has lived or one has a good moral stance on life and lives a good moral life with a lot of good moral actions every day, the correct moral actions every day one tends to feel a lot lighter in oneself and this is why mo a moral life or morality is a bedrock to success for further for further things right and and morality comes in part of is part of the right resolve right action right speech right livelihood right right efforts okay and right views because Morality and views, how you view life, <clears throat> well, they, they go hand in hand in a lot of ways. So there's the, there's the mundane views and then there's the views that lead to the uh, uh, local tara, which is the beyond, the beyond the world, right, to the ultimate aim of Buddhism, right, of the Buddha's path. So when we're talking about <clears throat> steadiness and we're talking about entering a state of steadiness and staying there, this is crucial to practice and crucial to life because what we tend to do now there's a very good uh, discourse called the 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 Lokodharma, the Lokodharma discourse, which the Buddha talks about the the eight mundane qualities that a just a normal person has and what's the difference between um, a person who has realized some stage of the path and a person who hasn't, and the Buddha goes into quite a deep discussion on these things so you know I'll, I'll talk about like for example I don't want to talk about all of them because I want you to read that that discourse it's called the Lokodharma Sutta, the Lokodharma Sutta right 
So that sutta talks about gain and loss, fame and shame, uh, 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 pain and pleasure, uh, and what was the other one? Fame and shame, pain and pleasure, uh, <clears throat> you know, birth and death, these kind of things, right? But in in there's there's one there that I'm that's not coming to mind right now. It's not birth and death, but that's still part of Loka Dharma anyway. But but it's not one of the factors that the Buddha talks about. Anyway, go look it up, and you can write it in the comment and tell me what those eight factors are, right? So in this, <clears throat> when I started this talk, I talked about this uh, discourse called An Auspicious Night, right? An Auspicious Night. This Auspicious Night, right, the Buddha talks about two, there's two words in there that are very key, that are key to the whole discussion. I mean, there's a lot of things in that little discourse. It's a very little one. And we chant it regularly as well. But there are two words in there that are key um, that, you know, I've told people close to me to always be aware of when confronting life's problems. And the Buddha says that one who sits with a mind, right, that's unvanquished, unshaken all throughout the night. So no matter what's happening, right, the, the, the mind is able to be unvanquished, unshaken. One has seen and there's other things as well, but one has had an auspicious night. In other words, the, the person has maintained a state of steady equilibrium mentally throughout the whole day and night, right, in practice. And this is auspicious, right? This leads to, it's not, it's, 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 I guess when we talk about concentration practice and we talk about jhana or the fourth jhana, the fourth jhana is still a state of mind. It's still not, uh, nirodo, it's still not the cessation of dukkha, it's still not nibbana, but we're getting there, right? <clears throat> and we don't talk about nibbana because, quite frankly, I've yet to experience it, okay? But the Buddha, I have strong faith, I have strong faith in the Buddha's teachings, um, and this is important. Strong faith leads to miracles, right? When you have strong faith in things and strong faith in practice, things can ha will happen. Uh, faith is definitely a quality that uh, needs to be developed and cultivated when you understand what real faith is. Faith is not just believing, it's believing and seeing and believing that there is potential because of what you're seeing. So in other words, progression. So this is perhaps not, is a bit misunderstood in, in Buddhism. It's uh, like in, I guess in the, in a lot of worldly religions and th other religions, it's you have faith without seeing. You don't have to. You don't have to see. Um, you know. You don't have to believe. You just have to have faith. In Buddhism, it's a little bit different. I mean, there's a strong faith, but there is a result too. You have to. I believe that there has to be a bit of re, has to be a result as well, because then when you see that a result, you then see that there is possibility for progression. Possibility for. Um, progression and capability further down the track so in other words if I'm, I'm learning a craft of any kind or i'm learning uh, a sport or learning a skill of any kind and i and i have i don't have any of that skill to begin with and when i start to practice under direction then i start to see myself improving that develops a bit of faith because i can see that there's progression so if i can get to so for in for example if i can build a uh, a door why can't I build a wall if I can build a wall maybe I can build four walls if I can build four walls who said I can't build a roof so you start to see progression and capability and this is important in faith right so coming back to steadiness because I veered off there for a minute coming back to steadiness steadiness is really important because in practice a lot of things can happen in life, a lot of things can happen, right? And there's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of what we call the world. There's the worldly flow, the nature flow, and then there's the flow of wisdom, right? There's the flow, the flow of wisdom, which is going kind of the other direction. So that the world and samsara has a flow, and the flow of wisdom doesn't follow that. It goes contrary to that, 
right? It doesn't go that direction, it goes the other way, right? Because what we're trying to do is cut through these ebbs, these flow, these, you know, ebbs and weaves and things that just go up and down all the time. Now, a lot of people like to follow the ups and downs and particularly in experience, particularly when listening or having debates or talking or communicating with other people, there's always a reactivity going on. And you see that on the street all the time. You see that in life, uh, particularly um, with the more personal the relationship, uh, the more likely there's going to be reactivity or more sensitivity because it's close to the bone. So if someone, like if, if you, I, I, you, you may have experienced this, I experienced when you're talking to a stranger, you're likely less to react than someone that you really know, like your mother, your father, your brothers, your sister, a, part, a long-term partner, for example, right? Or a long-term friend. Um, when, when you're criticized by these people, right? There tends to be more of a reaction to it or when you criticize them or when it's time to say the truth, there's, it's, it's very, very risky, it's dangerous. You're, you're walking a very uh, tight line and you're taking a risk, you might risk the relationship. This is unfortunate because, and it also shows one thing, that relationships are usually conditional, right? They're usually conditional. There's usually an agreement, right? As long as we're getting along, everything's fine. Otherwise, hit the road, Jack, <laughs> right? That kind of thing. So the steadiness is what helps us a lot um, in terms of our relationships with other people and this is why it's important steadiness and the results of steadiness are actually very skillful and beneficial for ourselves and others and I'll give you an example for example listening like so many times when people come uh, to the temple and ask questions you can see in their mind they've asked the question you know, and the per I, I've seen senior monks giving answers and the person's not listening they're just waiting they're just in their mind they're right they're waiting to ask the next question so they're not ask. they're not listening they're not taking in and then they just keep asking more and more questions and you know this this happens a little bit in the buddhist world because i think when people read that part where the buddha says you know the buddha says when someone asks a lot of questions it means they're intelligent right so some people read that and they just start asking a lot of questions. But I, I mean, I think that's true, but I don't think that's sincere, right? It's, it's different. There's a, sincerity, there's a sincerity in asking questions and there isn't. There's one, you're trying to act intelligent and you, or you are intelligent and you're trying to find out. There's, there is a difference. There is a difference here. So, and this can get us also into trouble with others, right? But this reactivity comes a lot from misinformation or misunderstanding, which happens all the time, all the time. We misunderstand people, we don't know, because you see there's, there's this inclination that we, you know, when we're communicating with people, especially people we've known for a long time, that we know what's going through their mind. And we don't take that, we don't check ourselves. We don't check ourselves. I mean, look what goes through your own mind every minute. You know, sit with yourself for half an hour and just look at where the mind goes. You know, look at where the mind goes. Now, of course, that's not proper concentration because we need, we need to be directing the thought in a certain direction or in a certain object. But when you're flowing, right, when you're, when you're in, the, in, in, in the mind sense, in mano, you tend to, or in the floating in the consciousness, you, when you're floating there in the consciousness with the thoughts it just, it's like a it's like a pinball machine and the and it's just going over here and over there and over here and over there so this uh gets us into a lot of problems causes a lot of problems for ourselves now listening is a is a very very good skill to have but it's a crucial skill it's crucial right so when people ask questions when you ask someone a question you need to wait, listen, and take in what the person is saying. Now, this is also no, this is also a practice in patience and tolerance. Even if the person is saying uncomfortable things, if you find that there's an emotional reaction to it, or something that's coming out to it, 
right? There's something inside you that needs to be looked at, obviously. Now, of course, of course, there's a thing called wrong speech, right? In Buddhism, you know, or harsh speech, gossip speech, that, you know, there's stuff that's just not good. So you shouldn't be listening to it or, you know, you should cut the conversation. That's understood, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, 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 the steadiness side in order to protect ourselves or protect yourself from unwarranted, un, unwarranted you know, unhealthy mental states. You, also, you always want to aim towards having like a, a healthy mental state, right? And without steadiness, it's hard to get there. And also, do you really want to be reacting to everything that's going on in the world? And this is not just about communication, although I'm kind of talking about that more so because that's a big subject, but also things just going on in life, for example. Like steadiness helps. For example, there's a, there's a discourse where Venerable Sariputta and, and Venerable Mahamogalana passed away. And Buddha was sitting there uh, in the assembly and he said, well, uh, something like, you know, I, I can't remember exactly, but something like, well, you know, it feels like something, it seems like something is missing here, you know, without these, you know, very two great, uh, you know, monks. However, my mind is unaffected, right? He said, his mind is not affected, okay? Now, some people might think, well, that's robotic. Well, that's insensitive. Well, he's not a human being not understanding the, the difference between a steady mind, a steady and strong mind, a, a cultivated mind, as opposed to an undisciplined mind, right? A disciplined mind, an undisciplined mind, a not steady mind and a steady mind. There's a big difference. It's not that it doesn't affect you. It just doesn't rock you to the core, right? It stays on the periphery. It doesn't go, it doesn't go deep inside and rock your whole world because most people that, have mental problems or um, get stressed out very easily kind of thing, right? Something happens and it triggers off or, you know, that, that word is the, the, the key word these days, trigger. It triggers off a set of uh, reactions that make the person feel very at ease and uncomfortable to the point where they might not even walk out the, walk out the door that day or do anything that day or get, get really sick or get very depressed, right? This is a big problem, you know, suicide is a problem. Mental depression is a problem. Now, I'm not talking mental depression in the clinical sense. I'm talking about just thoughts in general. And when the mind is not uh, developed and cultivated uh, with discipline, with the correct, with the correct concentration, with the correct views and the correct resolve and the correct action, a lot of disasters can happen. You see, that Buddhism is a lot more than just um, sitting down and concentrating. There's a lot of effects. Where, you know, there's a lot of things that Buddhism does for society when we're working on ourselves. One, a person who has a steady mind, a really concentrated and steady mind in the right way, and there's a wrong way. There is a wrong way because someone can have a concentrated mind and be steady but also be evil. And we've seen that, uh, like, for example, with Devadatta, and you see that, you know, in prison, there's a lot of disciplined people there. A lot of disciplined people there. And they've been able to uh, commit horrors, right? Even in war, you look at the soldiers, they're very disciplined, but they commit horrors. They commit horrors. So in Buddhism, that's not the right concentration. That's not, that's not correct action, right? It's not correct action. And it always leads to... Uh, it doesn't lead to anything good in the long run. So that's why we're trying to change. But this also, you know, doubles down on the point of how Buddhism is very good for society and, be, and pra practicing Buddhism is good for yourself and really good for others. Because when your mind becomes steady and more steady and more steady and more steady, I don't know if there's ever an end point here, but you're able to communicate, you're able to live in life, live life without walking down the street and being affected that everything that happens or every small thing that happens or every large thing that happens, right? And when you're having conversations with loved, loved ones or friends or anybody, you're less apt to react yes, or react negatively. 
uh, you know, in a negative way. This is, this is really important in relationships and uh, how you uh, carry yourself in society, in your work, uh, with distinguished people, non-distinguished people, in dangerous neighborhoods even, right? It can protect you at times because you, know, you might react uh, in a you know, fear, you know, people can catch on to fear and worry and they can feed off that too. When you're steady, when you have a very steady uh, posture mentally, right? that also exudes a lot of confidence and that's a protection in itself right so the two words uh the buddha talks about in uh an auspicious night is unshaken and unvanquished and i guess that's the culmination of what a steady mind can lead to in a lot of ways is because when you're sitting it we, uh, if you ever tried sitting from let's say sunset to sunrise for example and you've been outside a lot of things happen you got to deal with mosquitoes. It might rain. Uh, there's in, you know, mosquitoes are the the obvious one, but there's a lot of insects. There's wild animals. Um, it's also it, it, the weather's not might not be so good. Um, there's also the pain of sitting. Uh, you got to deal with sweat. Uh, you got to deal with the pains of concentration and all kinds of things. And then there's your own mind. Then there's your own mind, which is the big one, which was uh, it takes you. When you're trying to, uh, I guess, direct it to the steady way, things come up from your past. Uh, you might think a lot of things. Uh, you might project into the future. There's a lot of things going on there, especially when the mind's undisciplined. There's a lot of reaction and a lot of distraction, right? And also because citta um, is used to uh, extrapolating, inf going up and extrapolating information from the six base senses, Right, the chitta is not used to sitting steadily in itself, and I talked about that in my previous video. It's called uh, chitta in chitta, right? One of the culminations of the fourth jhana, and a very close step, I guess, very close to realization of cessation. Right? Now, this is indeed a very, very uh, high. St uh, I don't know. You know, you know, I don't like to use the word high, low levels, stages, but I'm quite limited in the language, but anyway, it's quite close. It's quite close to the goal, I believe, from what I've heard. So when we're practicing and we're able, when we're practicing in ourselves, the mind, right? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> Sometimes talking to this camera, I just, I realize I'm talking to a camera and there's no people here and kind of drift off. So it's a bit of an excuse, but it's true at the same time. I'm not... This is not really, doesn't really come natural. I don't think it comes natural to anybody to tell you the truth, just talking into a camera. But anyway, I digress. So when we're talking about your own mind and, and trying to uh, direct it, right? Because obviously one of the practices of concentration is you're practicing a parikama or a preparation object and you're directing your mind into that object or that concentration and you're directing it, you keep directing the mind, directing the mind. In a certain direction and then from there start the mind starts to be less reactive less dis, uh, less reactive it starts to be less distracted it starts to become more peaceful more serene more tranquil but we don't but we want to go even further than that to silent and we even want to go further than that to the word that is used is called equanimity where the mind abides in equanimity where it no longer um, clings to anything it doesn't it doesn't flinch if it there's pain or pleasure. It doesn't. It's non-discriminating, right? It's in in a state of non-discrimination of everything, of all experiences, right? Of all things, and that's um, classically uh, defined as the fourth jhana, right? Uh, very, indeed, a very, uh, I guess, uh, good state to be in. I, I was going to say advanced, or you know, uh, high level. But, you know, is it high level? I don't know. It's here, isn't it? But anyway, it's a good state. Let's say it's a, it's a very good state to be in, right? So this, this steady state, when, it, when not only in practice, but when you're dealing with the community out there, so how we listen to people, when you're really steady, uh, you're able to take the truth out of the words and discard the rest. You're able to live uh, around people being unshaken and unvanquished. 
Now imagine that for a moment, right? Imagine having a mind that is unshaken, that is unvanquished. Imagine that for a moment, right? So in other words, you're not reacting to every single impulse, right? The mind's not reacting to every single impulse, um, every single experience, um, you know, uh, something that's a loss of, a, a gain of something, a loss of something, you know, or, you know, something bad happens, something good happens, and your mind not fluctuating in that emotional state all the time, right? Now, a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, function in that state a lot of the time because they're not aware that there there is this path. They're not aware that there is this there there is a way out of it, right? There is a way out of that stress, right? It's quite stressful. Imagine living life, and a lot of people do this, and I myself did this before uh, when I was a young lad. Always just living off that stimulus. Right, just reacting always to the stimulus. I could barely have a con conversation with anybody without uh, getting all riled up or angry or sad or react. How how dare you say that to me and this and that? Right now, of course, again, um, there's always a line to what I say. Right, it's there's, it's not absolute. What I'm saying is never absolute because there there is a line to discussion. Right, there is a line to what you should accept into your life, what kind of behavior you should accept into your life or tolerate. Some things are not to be tolerated at all. Some things are to be avoided. Some, some things are to be discarded or banished from your life completely, to, to be totally uh, abandoned completely, certain behaviors. And not, not only in yourself, because there are things that we need to abandon in ourselves um, to, go, to go further in life, right, of course, right? But also, you know, people or behaviors or certain situations that uh, we should not tolerate, right? So because there's, there's this kind of thing that Buddhists, uh, we should always tolerate everything. Well, not really. That's not how it works. That's not realistic. I mean, you know, it, it, let's just have a, a, a brief example. In your own home, you know, someone you might have worked, uh, you know, for, for us uh, average people, you know, most people have to get a loan for 30 years and work hard. You know, there's certain things in your home that you've worked hard for that you're not going to tolerate and you shouldn't tolerate. You know, you know if someone comes in with a, uh, a marker and just starts, you know, you just painted the walls and, and maybe your kids, whatever, but I'm talking in general like a guest, you know, or someone comes in and starts uh, defecating on your floors, for example, that shouldn't be tolerated. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know what world you live in, but you know, there, there's a there's a thing that we need to be careful of is that uh, this the word tolerate. But the Buddha, there's there's a few qualities. There's avoiding, there's abandoning, there's tolerating, there's enduring, right? And and not, I think the fifth one is abstaining. You see, I, I've got to get back to reading i'm very rusty in my uh in my theory right but the point the point of the matter is is there's a time to tolerate but there's a time not to tolerate there's a time to act there's a time to abandon or there's a time to avoid right or there's a time to uh, to banish or move on right like for example the old argument about violence and things like this well i've talked about the difference between protection and violence um and what if someone was to harm a, a family member or a friend, um, it's non-Buddhist to want to protect them, or you know you're being non-Buddhist or non, you know you're you're being weak because you're reacting to that situation. Now, reacting to that situation, this is where it gets a bit tricky with the the mental the mental steadiness. However, I'm saying that in a normal sense. Now, in a when the mind is in a steady state, right, and you've got wisdom flowing, I tell you what, you know what to do in that situation a lot better than having a mind that's undisciplined, right? Think of it. Think about it. Think about it. When you're confronted with a situation, think about it if your mind is far more disciplined, right, is much more disciplined, it's quite steady, it's non-reactive, right, when a negative situation occurs do you think you'll deal with that situation better 
or do you think you, you, you would deal with that situation better with an undisciplined mind? See, because having a steady mind doesn't mean life stops. Now, don't misunderstand me, right? Having a steady mind. See, don't look for uh, silver bullets or the, the, key to, uh, the key to, you know, all the problems out there. Just because you've got a steady mind doesn't mean problems aren't going to happen. doesn't mean uh, bad situations aren't going to happen or misfortunes and things like this. What I'm talking about is the difference between having a steady mind and an unsteady mind, a difference between being unvanquished, unshaken, to shaken and vanquished. That's what I'm talking about, those differences, right? They're, they're a world apart. So as I was talking about tolerance and things like this, See, you can have a steady mind, but someone around you or a family member, there might be a violent situation, for example, right? So how would you deal with that? Okay, well, the mind's not going to react. It's not going to be in a react, like it's not going to react unskillfully, for sure. It's less likely to. And you're less likely to do something more skillful in that situation than not. But to tolerate, you know, family members or people getting hurt, I don't think you can't ask that of a Buddhist and I don't think you can ask that of anybody to tell you the truth. I think it's unrealistic. Now, of course, I'm not condoning violence. I'm not condoning. I'm not saying one should go out and be violent. This is a whole difference. I'm talking about you're sitting there and someone just comes along and slaps you in the face. Now, of course, the ultimate is there's no reaction to that either. But then the challenge is what would you do if it's your mother or your father? then it becomes difficult what to do. So the, steady, the steadier you are, the more wisdom you've got flowing through your mind, the more, you're, the more discipline you're going, uh, I guess the more cultivation development you have, the more apt you are to do the correct thing in the situation, as opposed to the opposite, which is starkly clear. I mean, it's very clear, isn't it? Like if your mind is undisciplined, when something like that happens, you might go above and beyond of what is needed in that situation. Okay, so this is kind of what I wanted to talk about today into steadiness, right? Uh, out of reactivity, right? Remo remove uh, reactivity out of your life. So in other words, you, you're still, life is still occurring and you're still reacting. I mean, you still got to, you're walking down the street and a car sideswipes because you've got a steady mind. You're not going to move out of the way. Of course you are. <laughs> don't take this, don't misunderstand this. It's, it's not... I'm not talking in absolute terms, right? However, if the mind is steady, right, and you get hit by the car, you know, there's, there's many examples of monks or people with steady minds doing incredible things and going through incredible amounts of pain when not being affected so much. You know, there's, uh, there's so many stories. There's so many stories, right? All you got to do is tap into it. I don't want to go off in that direction but definitely even dealing with physical pain <clears throat> you see the fourth jhana the buddha talks about the fourth jhana is one when the mind is in a state of equilibrium or equi 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 equanimity right i like to use the word equilibrium i guess but i guess equanimity is the correct term so we'll we'll stay theoretically correct but no pain is felt or sensed because the mind's not going out the mind's not listening to the six senses anymore. It's still there. It's still listening, but it's not listening. It's not paying attention anymore, right? And, and, and so the pleasure and pain don't exist in that state of mind. Now, can you imagine that? Now, that's not bliss yet. That's not Nibbana, but isn't that good? Isn't that a good thing? So when one gets used to being in that state of mind through concentration practice and having all the ducks in a row in terms of all the eight factors in, 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 the, in, in a row, like having your views in line, having your resolve in line, having your speech in line, having your action in line, having your livelihood in line, having your efforts in line, having your focus and awareness in line, and having your concentration in line. Now we're talking about a whole different way of life. We're talking a, a completely different perspective on life right one is much freer i'll tell you now and your and your destiny is definitely going in a great direction in a good direction and guess what 
that is great for you and it's fantastic for others, right? Because you're not spreading your tox toxicity anyway. You're not spreading uh, undisciplined fetters all over the place, right? You're not doing that anymore. And what you're doing is you're, you're, you're abiding in great states of mind, in good states of mind. You're not doing any unwholesome deeds. You're not uh, participating in any unwholesome actions, right? You're not participating in any forms of evil, right? More, more of what comes out of your mouth is uh, beneficial and true and fruitful. You're not engaging in behaviors that hurt yourself and hurt others. I mean, how many, how many more benefits? You know, there's so many more, but how many more do you want? Isn't that enough already? There's a lot more. There's freedom, right? There's unbinding, right? There's cessation of dukkha, nirodo, right? Which is what we're trying to get to. So going into steadiness is definitely a, a strong aim. Now, I get some people from time to time from different walks of life. In this temple here, I don't talk to many people. In the last year, I haven't been really engaging in... It's more online from comments and people contacted me on uh, Buddhist Cafe um, and... and uh, asking me certain questions. I've had all kinds of different people, sports people, what can I do to improve? Well, I tell you, Buddhism and the teaching of the Buddha is good for any walk of life or any profession if you want to get forward, go forward. Steadiness is important because a result of steadiness, there's so many, there's so many. I don't, I don't think I have uh, enough time to go through the list. But I'll, I'll tell you just one, one indirect benefit of a steady mind is contentment. Now imagine when you're sitting for hours and you're just not you're not really uh, going here or there in your mind anymore, and you're able to sit still and just having that equilibrium or equanimity in in your mind, where it's not really sensing pain or pleasure or anything like that. It's in a very concentrated state, very steady. You're very content, aren't you? That's an indirect result immediately. There's also uh, serenity, tranquility, peacefulness, silence, um, a, a sense of lightness. There's so many indirect benefits of being having a mind in a steady state that when you approach any of your endeavors in life, whatever endeavor it is, whatever relationship it is, you're apt to do the right thing, right? Now, again, um, I I'm kind of getting into this other area of tolerance and avoid. I need to explain that because Sometimes people think that uh, when you're practicing um, or when you're dealing in life is you've got to tolerate everything. You've got to tolerate everything, right? It's not so because even in the, in, in the monastic code in, in Buddhism, you know, there is a point where some monks need to be banished from the temple. There is cause for that. Sometimes thing, some behaviors are just not tolerated. And the Buddha makes this clear with the four uh, parajika karmas or the, the actions that entail defeat as a monk, right? So, for example, if a monk uh, engages in sex, right? If a monk uh, uh, kills another human being, if a monk steals um, of something of a more value of, I don't know, a few dollars, um, and if a monk is uh, making false claims about himself, right? He's out. That monk's out. Can no longer be in the sangha anymore, right? And then there's the there's a third there's thirteen further rules that entail rehabilitation, which are very strict. And there's no there's no negotiation, right? So the Buddha wasn't like, oh, monks can do whatever they want. We will tolerate all kinds of bad behavior. It's all okay. It's not like that at all, right? So there are things in life that even with a steady mind. That we ought to, that we, we we avoid we we avoid we endure we um, we tolerate we um, confront that's the one confront some things need to be confronted right um, so those five things I think that's this is what they are avoid tolerate confront um, Avoid, tolerate, confront. Um, avoid, 
tolerate, confront, abandon, endure. Yes, I'm not going to say them again. I'm going to forget it. All right. So those those five qualities are important. So there's some things you have to endure. Enduring is a bit different from tolerating. It's more like a, um, enduring means like, for example, uh, you've you've got you've got to do some hard work today and it's really tough work, but you've got to get it done, right? You've got to clean the toilet today, right? <laughs> um, tolerate is more got to do with things that are coming your, that, that are coming your way. Uh, like for example, mosquitoes are to be tolerated. Insects are to be tolerated. Uh, bad weather is to be, harsh conditions are to be tolerated, right? Certain people are to be tolerated. But then again, the Buddha says, well, you can also avoid you can confront, you can endure with these people, or you can abandon, you can just ignore, right? Avoid completely, right? So remember, there's, that we don't just have to sit there and put up with bad behavior from people or violent behavior from people, right? So anyone who thinks a Buddha should sit there and just keep getting slapped in the face, I disagree with that. I mean, there's that famous example where the Buddha talks about, well, there's two examples, the simile of the saw, Right, which is a famous one. I'm sure all of you know about that one. And there's the other one where uh, I forget the, the the venerable's name, but he's going to teach in a, a violent area, and the, the Buddha asked him, "Well, if they uh, cut off your right arm, what what are you going to do? If if they also cut off your left arm, what are you going to do?" And this and that. Those situations are a little bit different because we're talking about a certain level of uh, being there where he's talking to an arahant so this is kind of uh, a bit of a si different situation however i'm not saying it, the buddha is saying you've, you've got to fight back but however in certain situations you're allowed to strike out in the rules for example like if someone touches you sexually or like for example if i'm sitting in a private place and a woman comes or a man comes even these days it's men too right they try to come and abuse me sexually, I'm allowed to strike out in defense. I'm also allowed to fight for freedom, right? So that example of the simile of the saw, where having compassion is showing how deep the compassion should run um, or the goodwill should run. And in that one, it's also, it's kind of like, I think it's a lesson in tolerance of bad individuals of understanding. The Buddhist warning this person that he's walking into a very uh, dangerous situation. So you can look at it that way as well, right? But there are there are situations where monks can defend themselves. I'm talking monks. Now, lay people, it's a whole different story. Lay people don't follow these rules, okay? Now, normally, the biggest question I always get is, what do you do um, if someone, you know, if, if violence occurs, bad situations occurs, this and that? Well, first of all, your practice is a self-defense, your state of mind is a self-defense to begin with. Prevention is the best, is the best, right? But sometimes it hits, it hits the fan, right? You can't be helped. Things happen, right? So, you know, it's, there's no bulletproof solution to this. It's an art form. Self-defense is an art form. Living in life, living life is an art form in a lot of ways. The more skillful you are, the more abilities you have, the more virtues you have, the more you, that you are cultivated and developed, the better chances you ha have of having a better life or a peaceful life in the, in the lay sense, in the normal sense. In terms of what we're getting to in the deep Buddhist teachings, well, of course, we're trying to go to complete cessation, right? That's what we want. That's what, what, where we're heading toward is uh, no more rebirth, no more, no more birth and death, no more old age, no old age and sickness. Okay, so you know, there's, there's, there's always degrees to, to, to these teachings and that's why the dharmas, there's just so many. There's so many teachings and it's a big study and I talked about how big of a study this is in the previous week, but I, you know, again, it's a big study. But you know, the, the, the problem we have is we always go back to primary mathematics. One plus one equals two. It's simple. It's not. And it is, right? They're, they're both true. But you got to remember, they're both true. It's kind of like, uh, you know, we, we tend to always think uh, there's just one truth. Like, for example, you say anything is possible. That's true. 
anything is not possible. That's true too. That's true too. Right? So there's, there's always a duality or there's probably a third thing there too as well. Because it's not, the truth is sometimes not so crystal clear. Right? But what we do know that in dharmas, there's degrees, there's, there's, there's you know, like all the colors, uh, which is that cliche has been used over and over again, the colors in between black and white. Da, da. But black and white do exist. Black and white do exist. There are opposite, um, you know, uh, ends of the spectrum and there is the middle and, the, and, and all the things, right? But so we can't ignore black and white and we can't ignore the other shades, right? So that's how why a steady mind is helpful as well because you can penetrate these things deeper and you can understand, you can mature into this and understand the, th the 363, the 360 degree perception problem. We talked about this before as well. So in other words, on any issue, there could be 360 degrees of reasons something can happen. It's one of them. Or two of them, which makes it simple. That makes it simple. One plus one equals two. Sure, in that sense. But which one is it in the spectrum of the 360 degree angle? You know, <laughs> in the, you know, coming out from the center. I'm talking about any situation, uh, any you know, the, all the things that happen in life. Well, there's there's coincidence, there's tragic, there's all kinds of things that happen. But the steady mind allows you to see it all. Because we also, see, once a person has a steady mind, one can penetrate. And the Buddha talks about this frequently. When, when his mind was deep in the fourth jhana, when he, he said, when my mind was very, when his mind was, when the Buddha's mind was very steady, was, was uh, uh, in a state of equanimity, it was very, you know, very, it was very uh, postured, you know, powerful, strong. At that point, he, he directed the mind to uh, analyzing certain things, to seeing things, right? That, so it doesn't stop there, right? It, just because you got fourth jhana or, or you've got a steady mind, oh, it's life, you know, it finishes. No, unfortunately, there's more, right? There's more to it, right? But we're talking about steps and steps, and I can't, we can't talk about everything, every video. I can just make one video, and that's the channel, for example. Just go, just practice the the you know cultivate and develop the eight factors that's it that's the video see you later there's no need to do dharma talks anymore <laughs> but however the buddha gave a lot of dharma talks and monks give a lot of dharma talks because it's a it's a constant memory problem as well that we have we've got constantly uh, got to keep remembering what uh what what dharmas are right now when the mind gets into a steady state there's a penetration issue uh it it, it gets in it can penetrate into things and really delve deep into things now think of this for a moment right and i think this will be my last one uh, for this one think of trying to sort out a problem with an undisciplined mind or a mind that's reactive and distracted a mind that cannot sit still a mind that can cannot be directed to anything think of that state of mind right and then think of a mind that can be directed a mind that is not reactive, a mind that's not distracted, and a mind can penetrate, right? That's what we're aiming for here, at least on the concentration level, right? That's what the fourth jhana is all about, and that's what all the practice is all about, right? So then you go into vipassana or investigation, right? Once the samadha, once, the, once everything's converged, then one goes into analyzing qualities, right, which is an, a step towards closer step towards cessation, right? So this, the, this, the, the stark difference is, is quite obvious, to me at least. Like, you, you imagine confronting difficult situations or communications with an undisciplined mind, a mind that's fettered, you know, with, with, with reactivity on, on all levels or it's so scattered and, and distracted. Where does that lead you? Even having wealth, financial wealth with a mind like that you're poor you're poor that's why someone that has a steady mind right or it has that level you know not only if that person's rich financially that person's has a lot of wealth here 
And if someone doesn't have financial wealth but has a steady mind, they don't really need much. You don't. You only need the four thing, the four requirements to exist, and that's about it. You can live content. That's why a lot of monks, since the Buddha's passing, we talk of millions, can live a serene life as a monk with very little. And people ask how. Well, the Buddha says when one starts to get one one bells in jhana, you don't need much else. You just need the four requirements. You just need a bit of food every day. Enough clothes to cover the body, just a hut, right? And just some medicine, that's it. That's all you need. Because the whole idea is to abide in that, to abide in, to, to go forth, to, to go to cessation with, according to the Buddha, is total bliss, right? Is, is the combination of what the practice should bring it to. Now, if you're not practicing and you're in that life, it can be quite difficult, right? But that's how important uh, the development of steadiness is in, in not just in, the monk life, but in the worldly life, and for if you love your parents, if you love your family, uh, if you if you love, and I'm sure you do, and love in the sense or respect them, or you want to pay back people, this is a good way to do it. If you want to improve society, you need to steady yourself up, because that will help you um, navigate um, and communicate with others more skillfully. Right? And that's all for today.